Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is monitoring institutions. And our big question for this lecture is how can oversight create cooperation? Last time we did a whole bunch of things. We talked about what rival goods are and what excludable goods are. And based off of those descriptions, we have four different types of goods in total. We gave examples for all of those. And we talked about how non-excludable goods like common pool goods such as fisheries and public goods such as clean air can be underprovided for. And now in this lecture specifically, we're going to be focusing on common pool goods, and we're going to talk about how monitoring institutions can ensure that common pool goods aren't exploited. To make this a little bit more concrete, let's look at a satellite image of Lake Ontario. Just to orient yourself here, this is Toronto up here. We have Niagara Falls down here, and the University of Rochester, where I go to school, is about right there. So in general, Canada's up north, New York is down south. Like any other lake with fish in it, Lake Ontario has a big problem with overfishing. Why is overfishing a problem? Well, just think about this in the extreme. If I capture all of the fish in Lake Ontario today, that leaves no fish left over to repopulate the lake tomorrow, which means the fishing industry will be gone after today. So what fishing industry wants to do in general is capture as many fish as it can today, contingent on the fact that it needs to leave a lot of fish left over in order to repopulate the lake for tomorrow and next week and next year to ensure that our fishing industry will be sustainable over time. Now you might think that the solution to overfishing is to simply pass legislation. So suppose that New York passed a law that, that capped the amount of fish that a boat that comes into a New York port can have. Will this solve the problem? Well, you might initially think, again, that, hey, of course this will solve the problem. New York is limiting how many fish boats are capturing. But the issue is that fish tend not to follow international borders. So this is the international border between Canada and New York that I've drawn roughly into the map right there. These are imaginary lines. Fish pay no attention to these lines whatsoever. So if New York passes a legislation or passes some legislation to limit the number of fish that come into New York ports, what's going to happen is that the New York fishermen aren't going to be capturing very many fish, while the Canadian fishermen are still going to be doing whatever it is that they're doing, overfishing and therefore depleting the supply of the lake, which means in the long run, there aren't any more fish in the lake. And in the short run, Canada is capturing more fish than the United States is only because the United States passed this law or New York passed this law. So this doesn't work when only New York is passing a law to limit the amount of fish captured in Lake Ontario. The next step you might think is to have a treaty, right? If 1 million is the optimal cap on fish captured in the lake in order to make sure that the fishing industry will be sustainable, I just made up that million number. It's not exactly important what the number is specifically, there's just some optimal amount. And in order to ensure that this optimal amount gets that gets captured each year and not anymore, we have a treaty that limits both sides to an equitable distribution of 500,000 fish each. Now, it appears that this treaty is going to be good to go. And the reason for that is we're essentially in one of those prisoner's dilemma types of situations. And this is a repeated interaction, which means we can rely on grim trigger strategies to ensure that this will be enforceable. So if both sides are playing a grim trigger strategy here, then what that means is we're going to start out by capturing 500,000 fish this year. And if at any point during the interaction someone has violated this treaty by capturing more, this is where you throw the book at the other guy, you're playing a grim trigger strategy, and you try to capture as many fish as you can from then on in, in order to punish the guy. And as long as no one has violated the treaty before, then you continue following the treaty and you capture 500,000 fish each year. The incentives here match up very appropriately, right? I don't want to ever be in a situation where the other guy is going to punish me by trying to capture as many fish as he possibly can. And so as a result, I am inclined to continue following the treaty, despite the temptation in non-strategic terms, if I ignore what the other guy is doing, despite that temptation for me to try to exploit this treaty by a little bit. Now, an important hidden assumption in Grim Trigger strategies is that actors need the ability to observe past actions. If they can't observe what has happened in the past, then they can't actually play a Grim Trigger strategy. There's nothing that's going to be triggering the Grim Trigger. If I don't see what you did in the past, then I can't properly punish you for deviation. And so without this sort of monitoring, what's going to happen here is that those evil Canadians up north might be tempted to capture just a little bit more uh, fish than they're supposed to be in the treaty. So in the treaty, they're only supposed to be capturing 500,000 fish. They might want to go up to 600,000 fish. 
And yeah, this is going to deplete the jointly optimal long run cap, right? In the long run, we only want to be capturing 1 million fish in total. But because Canada is disproportionately enjoying the benefits today by capturing the 100,000 fish, and because both the United States and Canada are suffering the long run consequences, Canada really ends up in a better position here by slightly cheating on the treaty, knowing that it's going to be the United States and Canada that suffer the consequences together. Now, the solution is to craft monitoring institutions. Essentially, you create some bureaucracy that oversees what's going on on both sides. And yes, bureaucracy sucks for all of the reasons that bureaucracy normally sucks. And yes, bureaucracy is costly to maintain. But what bureaucracy does here is it creates an institution that can flag violations of the agreement of that treaty that we signed that's supposed to limit both sides to 500,000. And that will in turn allow states to correctly sanction violators. This is so that there's some guy up in Canada that's informing the United States if Canadian fishermen are violating the agreement, and there's some guy in New York who's informing Canadian authorities whether anyone in New York has violated the agreement. And because there aren't any incentives to violate the agreement, as long as there's a sufficient monitoring of what's going on, you get cooperation. And the alternative is to not have this bureaucracy at all and not have cooperation at all. And so despite the fact that it's costly and it sucks and it is bureaucracy, you actually want to maintain this. So that is how monitoring institutions can solve these problems with common pool goods and ensure that they will be continued to be provided for into the future. And that wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you next time when we talk about collective action problems. Take care.